Isaiah 40, 31, one more time. Those that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Two weeks ago, we considered this verse when it was translated vulture, which is another valid translation of the word of uh, the bird's word that is used here. But this week, we want to go back to the more traditional translation, eagle, which is also valid. My question is, why has it been the more traditional translation? Because it is more poetic? Because the eagle is better looking? Or we perceive the eagle as more majestic or graceful? Or because we associate it more with power and with our images of power and subtly for those of us in this country because it is our national bird and a symbol of our power in particular. I'm not certain even for myself, but it's worthy of consideration. The eagle is a predatory bird. It has been used as a symbol of power and empire, domination and violence, even long before the United States of America. So it is a question worth asking whether part of our attraction to having this and other scriptures translate this bird as eagle, when it could just as easily have been translated vulture, is because we find the image of the eagle feeds our subtle desires of nationalism, dominance, and exceptionalism, a kind of subtle and sometimes not so subtle idolatrous understanding of power. I won't be able to answer that question for any of us, but I invite us when we read this verse and others like the psalm that was used in the call to worship to wonder about this question as a way of checking on ourselves, our motivations, and our understanding of power. So that's my first point as we consider the eagle today. What is our attraction? To what degree do our subtle attractions to worldly power, nationalism, and dominance affect us? But still, apart from that consideration, there is something attractive when the prophet says, you shall mount up with wings as eagles, you shall run and not be weary, you shall walk and not faint. And when the psalmist writes that God satisf satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, that doesn't seem so bad, it seems pretty good. We do long for strength and youth to be renewed, sometimes bodily but also spiritually in our zeal for love and faith, in our relationship with God and our sense of purpose and mission in life, in our vision for the future and future generations. A few years ago, there was a false story about how eagles are renewed that was going around on social media related to Isaiah 40. It reported that around age 40, the eagle would go into seclusion and generate a new beak and new talons and new feathers in its wings such that it could live up to another 30 years. But there's a problem. Typically, eagles of various varieties live between 15 and 30 years. A few have lived as long as 50, but there is no evidence that even those few had gained new beaks or talons around age 40. So if you see that interpretation as to why the Bible talks about being renewed like eagles, don't buy it. But the eagle's feathers do continually renew via the process called molting where some feathers, old ones, come out and new ones grow in. It does, in a sense, on an ongoing basis, renew them. This might be what the prophet and the psalmist were referring to. How do we renew our feathers? How do we renew our ability to take flight in life on an ongoing basis? So my second point is really also a question. How do we find ways to continually renew our faith and vision? What feathers from our past, individually or collectively as a body of believers, may need to be shed so new patterns of individual faith or life as a body of believers can be established that will renew and strengthen us? <coughs> if 
Finally, it may seem that eagles are invincible, but that's not true. They do die, and they can be threatened and vulnerable. In recent years, eagles have shown their vulnerability. And do you know where their vulnerability lies? With us. Humans are their vulnerability, in particular our poisons. Our use of the synthetic pesticide DDT almost wiped out the bald eagle in the United States in the 1960s. But humans, in a pattern of cooperation with the eagles, have brought them back. And it has taken cooperation. In 1967, the bald eagle was declared a protected species. In 1972, DDT was banned, and in 1973, through, res, res, um, through legislation, other synthetic pesticides. Then the National Wildlife Refuge Network began creating eagle habitats. As that was done, the eagles, you might say, did their part. They procreated. When this process started, the nesting pairs of bald eagles in the United States was in the low hundreds. By 2007, they, they were, we were able to remove them from the endangered species list because there were by then close to 10,000 nesting pairs in the lower 48 states, 50,000 to 70,000 if you included Alaska and Canada. And that number has increased some still. Can we have an image of the eagle not rooted in brute strength, empire, and nationalism, but a new image of strength rooted in a continually renewing life of cooperation? And this is my third point. Maybe we can embrace the eagle not as a symbol of our allegiance to the power of empire and violence, but as a symbol of our commitment to hope and cooperation. Romans 12, 9 to 21 is one of the great behavioral ethics passages of scripture. It is rooted in the counterintuitive strength of love and nonviolence, of hope and cooperation. In this passage, we see that the positive images of the eagle, although it is never mentions the eagle, strength, holding fast, perseverance, in loving, in showing honor to each other, in hope, suffering, prayer, and hospitality. And verse 16 speaks to living cooperatively, in harmony with one another, where we know each other's gifts and vulnerabilities and emphasize each other's strengths. Just this past Thursday, as Walter mentioned in the peace candle lighting, was the memorial service for an activist, pastor, and patriot who embodied the view of the eagle and the type of ethical living in the way of Jesus that Paul describes in Romans 12. John Lewis. Lewis was a leader in the civil rights movement who was one of the first at age 20 to do one of the infamous nonviolent lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville, Tennessee. He was one of the freedom writers in his early 20s. He was the youngest speaker at the 1963 March on Washington where the elder Martin Luther King at age 34 at the time gave his I Have a Dream speech. The younger John Lewis, age 23 at the time said, we want our freedom and we want it now. We do not want to go to jail, but we will go to jail if that is the price we must pay for love, brotherhood, and true peace. If Martin Luther King Jr. was prophet and poet, John Lewis was prophet and straight talker. He knew that his calling as a follower of Jesus and nonviolence and his role as patriot were going to be in tension with each other. He knew that he had to, keep continue, had to stay continually renewed in his spirit so that he could discern and keep causing what he called good trouble, necessary trouble, but in a framework of sacrificial love. He knew that the counterintuitive strengths of love and nonviolence, of hope and cooperation, not the false power of domination and violence, are ultimately what would bear us up on eagles' wings and redeem and renew not only the soul of this country, but of all humanity and creation. May it come to be so. And so we are called to mount up with wings like vultures and wings like eagles, where we question our allegiance to empire and violence, where we are continually finding sources of renewal, where we have strength and perseverance in causing and doing good trouble and working cooperatively. 
Amen. In your bulletin, the response on God of grace and God of glory, verses 1, 2, and 4. And read the third one. I invite you to join me in prayer, and I want to begin with a prayer that I found this week uh, written by the author Laura Jean Truman. Let's pray together. Gracious God, keep my anger from becoming meanness. Keep my sorrow from lapsing into self-pity. Keep my heart soft enough to keep breaking. Keep my anger turned towards justice, not cruelty. Remind me that all of this, every bit of it, is for love. Keep me fiercely kind. Gracious God, bear us up on eagle's wings that we can be bearers of good news, of peace, of your great grace and love for all of humankind. Be with us in the weeks ahead, whether we are facing health issues, dealing with injustice and oppression, whatever the issues are that we are facing, renew our spirits that we may be witnesses to you through Christ our Lord. Amen.
And now, go out into the world with a daring and tender love. The world is waiting. Go in peace. And all that you do, do it for love. Amen. Thank you.